Hey everybody, it's Zach again at NewTutorial.com coming in and making a video for you today. It's summertime, the temperatures are going up, and that means it's Shavuot. Uh, Shavuot comes in the summer, and um, you know, this is just it's another feast time that the Father commands his people to observe throughout all their generations. And so that's what we're doing this weekend. Um, we have uh, a Shabbat fellowship that we're going to, and then also we are uh, meeting with um, uh, some extended fellowship people in the area. Yeah, we're all coming together for Shavuot. And so we're going to observe that time together, um, get together on Sunday, uh, first day, and uh, you know do Bible study, just enjoy each other's company, and just observe the time that our Father calls us to observe. Um, there's not a lot of um, just people ask all the time, hey, how do I keep Shavuot? They're new to Torah, and they're like, hey, how do we do this? You know, what do we do? What you know, what's on the checklist that we have to go? And what, you know, what is required of Shavuot? And there's just not a whole lot. Uh, given in scripture that you know of things to do you know you know for passover and unleavened bread you know there are some things we need to observe not a lot but just a few um you know no unleavened bread you know you do you eat uh, no unleavened bread for for seven days um, and there's uh ceremonies for the passover and how you observe that and you know things for exocote you know having the palm branches and the, the goodly trees that you wave around and for shavuot there's just not a whole lot of things, you know, requirements. And so people ask, you know, what are we to do? We know that, you know, for the feast, we're, we are to go up to Jerusalem and uh, observe the feast there. All the men are required to go there three times a year. And this is one of those times. Uh, but without a temple today and with uh, within the, the diaspora, of the people who are scattered throughout all four corners of the earth because of our disobedience, um, there, you, just, you just can't do that today. And not only that, but if you were in Jerusalem, there's no temple, there's no priestly system, there's no way to participate in the uh congregational uh, rituals that would take place as as in scripture. So, um, you know, you just can't do that today. So, in the diaspora, we are, we find ourselves in the midst of Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 3, where it says, the people who have been scattered throughout the world because of their disobedience, they're once again hearing Torah and becoming obedient to it. And then a regathering at some point in the future is going to take place. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 3, you can check that out. So that's where we're at now. We can't do these things in Jerusalem. We're dispersed throughout all four corners of the earth. We're waking up. We're beginning to understand the Father's commandments through Moses and keeping them uh, the same exact way our Messiah did. So, um, be that as it may, we're still observing those times here. Uh, there, there's some things I wanted to address because of this this feast. I mean, it, it, every time a feast comes up, there's people who argue and 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 disagree um, sometimes very passionately about how these things are to be kept and what they mean. And so I just want to give you my opinion on these things. I'm not saying I in none of my videos I I try not to be the guy who says this is the way it should be and use the way you need to do it too. I, and people who've known me long enough understand that every Passover. I, you know, I do things the way I see them in Scripture. I'm not going to tell you you're, you're wrong if you do it differently. Um, there are people who di keep different dates. Um, you do it how you see the Scriptures. We're all learning in our walk. And so um, that's that's kind of what we're doing for Shavuot. I'm keeping it on first day this week. And, um, and you know, I, I started counting at the morrow after the Sabbath, the 50 days, seven weeks. Uh, and that's how we keep uh, uh, Shavuot. Now, there's some things that people argue about. And I wanted to kind of get into that. Number one is, you know, I've had numerous people since, you know, I started New Tatora, people who come up to me and says, Zach, when I look at the scriptures, when I look at Leviticus 23, it's very clear to me, Zach, that there are two first fruits or that they argue when the first fruits are. So, and, and I have to say, yes, that, that, that is correct. And so the, people will say we have to keep first fruits after Passover. It's that morrow after that first Shabbat. Uh, which is going to be a Sunday, that's first fruits. He has risen, you know, and, and people in the Christian church have no idea what first fruits is, even though it's mentioned numerous times in the Old Testament and numerous times in the, in the, in the Old and New Testaments. Um, they have no idea what that means, and that's what they call Easter, even though Easter is very much associated with pagan fertility. So um, first fruits is mentioned in Leviticus 23. It's verse 10. Let's go ahead and read that. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And then we have also verse 17. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. Um, and so right there, there are disagreements between people who email me and amongst fellowships 
that when is first fruits? Is it during the time of unleavened bread or is it in is first fruits actually during Shavuot? And people argue saying it's one or the other. Folks, this is one of the reasons why I believe you need to at least understand or attempt to live, try to live, try to understand an agrarian lifestyle. Because if you lived an agrarian lifestyle, you would understand that in the springtime coming out of the winter, if you're, if you're planting winter wheat, your harvest is going to be in the spring. You're going to have a harvest. And with a harvest, you have a first fruits of that harvest, which you offer up to God. Same in the summer. In the summertime, about now, you're going to have some harvest of the of the things you've planted in the early spring. Things are going to be hard. Right, right now in my garden, we have black uh, raspberries that are coming in. Um, we have uh, a number of herbs and different different grains could, that could be coming in. Um, we have uh, yeah, we have a number of things that are actually harvested. You know that that are, we are eating from our garden now. Uh, lettuces and all kinds of stuff that are harvested, harvestable now that you can t- partake in. Well, of that harvest, you're going to have a first fruits. And so living in an agrarian lifestyle, you're constantly planting your fields, planting your crops so that you can take of that harvest and use it for food for your family and for the community. Well, of those harvests, each one of those harvests, you're going to have a first fruit. So you're going to have a, you're going to have a fruit. The answer, folks, to this question is that you're going to have two first fruits. You can have a first fruits in the beginning. You can have a first fruits um, in the summer. And you're also going to have a first fruits in the fall. You're going to continue to harvest. When you come to that spring feast, when you come to that fall feast and summer feast, you're, you're not to show up empty handed. And so you're going to have something. Now, in agrarian lifestyle, a lot of times people would take that bring their first fruits of that harvest and bring it to the priest. Now, if you live too far away, you would turn that first fruits into money and bring it in your hand to and bring the money of that first fruits to the priest. And so uh, it just depended on, on your circumstances. Uh, but, the, but the Torah gives us circ- you know, uh, uh, ways to handle each one of those circumstances. So I hope that makes sense. You know, you're, people will argue that first fruits is in the spring. No, no, no. First fruits is in the summer. I'm like, no, both guys. If you understood an agrarian lifestyle, you're going to have first fruits throughout the year. Each time of the feast, you're going to show up without empty hands, and you're going to have that first fruits of what you're doing, um, you know, on your land, and you're going to bring that to the temple. Those those first fruits offerings. I hope that makes sense. The other thing that's really it seems I haven't heard this before, but now it seems like it's like people come up with new stuff all the time. <clears throat> They're saying that you count seven Sabbaths. So seven Sabbaths, that's a week is seven days. So seven times seven is 49. And then you count another 50 days after that. I've never heard this argument before, but all of a sudden on my Facebook feed uh, and email, it's like coming in with people telling me this. And I'm like, what? It does not say that. Let's read the verse. And I'll show you where they're getting confused. And you shall count. This is verse 15, chapter 23. And you shall count to you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. So what they're saying is, so you count the seven Sabbaths, and then the morrow after you count 50 days. Now, you're reading it wrong. (laughs) This is so ridiculous. You're reading it wrong. What's actually happening here, he's saying, count seven Sabbaths, and then the morrow after, that is 50 days. Okay, seven times seven is 49. Okay, the morrow after plus one is 50. You have counted 50 days. That is your Shavuot. I mean, read it again. Even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. It's not saying if you're, 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 you're getting messed up on the English. Even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. Because the morrow after the seventh Sabbath equals 50. (laughs) Uh, But there are some people out there who are convinced now, it seems like, that they're counting 7 times 7, 49, and then on the morrow after they're counting another 50. (laughs) That's 100, I guess. I don't don't, that that makes no sense whatsoever. And, um... And not only that, but no aspect of Judaism upholds that as pract- in practice. 
Um, I mean, if you're going to be looking to Judah as an example, uh, I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just saying if you're just going to go by, hey, what do you guys do over there? How do you interpret this? There's no one, no other sects of Judaism that interpret it that way. So um, it, I, some people, I think, just like to pull out new things to just pull out new things and, and, and stir the pot, it seems like. And I just don't, I don't understand that. Um, but that's not what it says. So that's, that's another argument that I've seen. Folks, when it comes down to Shavuot, here's what you need to remember. And, and this is just really what it comes down to this. Shavuot is about the commandments being given at Mount Sinai to a people, a nation that was not not yet a nation, brought out of bondage, brought to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and was given a covenant of a nation. Every nation has to have a constitution, a way, a, something that, that binds the people of that nation together. That was, that's what was given at Mount Sinai. It was a marriage that took place, a marriage that was contracted out and then consummated at Mount Sinai. Let me read you another verse. Exodus 24, verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. That is very important. They read the book of the covenant and all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Verse 8, And then Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Okay, so basically here's, here's the word, okay? And you said, I do. You're going to be obedient. And now the blood. It's a marriage. Folks, when a marriage is consummated between a, a husband and a bride, the blood is on the bride. Okay, without getting too graphic, the blood is on the bride. The, the marriage is now consummated. It's final. It's done. Nothing can undo it. So it's the same with this. The blood, they said, I do. We have heard your word. We will be obedient and do it. Okay, the blood is sprinkled on the people. The marriage is now consummated. There is a marriage there. And we know that those people and their descendants became disobedient. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, there's a divorce that takes place. The divorce is finalized. You are divorced because you played the harlot. Harlotry and adultery in the eyes of our father is meaning you're doing, you're going against what he, he has told you to do. This is the covenant. This is the marriage which you will live by. And you have broken it. And so you, you failed. Divorced. I'm sending you away because of your disobedience. I have divorced you. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8 and others. So the divorce has happened. He, has, he was a husband done to them, and now he has divorced. Now, you go back and you look at, um, at Passover with our Messiah. And, he, and, I, and I believe that the marriage, again, I, I, I believe you can make a case. I'm not positive on this, but I believe you can make a case uh, that, again, the marriage was consummated. And some people say, well, the marriage hasn't consummated yet. We're still betrothed to our Messiah. I think you can make a case that, there has been a reconsummation of that marriage with our Messiah when he says, this bread represents my body. The body, the, the body, the word made flesh, becoming the body. Folks, all throughout your scripture, bread, body, and the word are used synonymously. Bread, body, and word. They're all one and the same. And so when he says, I take this, this bread, this bread, I, which represents my body, Okay, that's the word made flesh. And then what comes next? The wine, which represents what? The blood. And he says, I will not drink of this wine. No, who drank of it? It was them, the bride, his disciples. They drank of the wine. And I believe you can make the case, thus consummating the marriage once again. Now, all that being said, if, if that's possible, and symbolically, like the first time in Exodus chapter 24, the marriage has been consummated. When our Messiah comes back, how will he find his bride? Will he find an adulterous bride? A bride that has gone away from the commandments, who is living like the rest of the world? Or will he find an obedient bride? A bride that's waiting for, his, for her groom to come back. Okay, what will he find? And at that point... What what are we to, what what is he to look for? He's gonna say he's gonna have all these people saying Lord Lord, all these. It's the same thing when a husband comes home to an adulterous bride. She you know she acts 
Even though she's been out playing the harlot, she acts like she's grateful to see her husband. But what does the husband say? Depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. The same thing that our father calls adultery in his word. He calls it adultery. You know, or will he says, will he look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. That, that's the thing. You know, when he, when he comes back, what kind of bride and in what condition will he find that bride? You know, I mean, that's, that remains to be seen. That's up to us. That's up to us. But that's what Shavuot is about. Shavuot is about a marriage that took place long ago and a, for, for a, between a husband and a bride in which the bride became adulterous and was sent out, scattered, divorced into the nations. And then now we have a bride that's coming back. A bride that's once again... There's a, a Folks, there's a revival going on right under our noses. A revival that Christianity has been praying for for decades upon decades. You know, all these Billy Graham revivals and all these rivals you see in the... Praying for a revival. A revival, it means to return. It means to be raised again. To revive oneself. To revive a body of people back into life. What does the scriptures equate life to? The Torah, the flesh, or the word, the word, the word, the, the the word that became flesh, who walked out the Torah perfectly. That's what it is, and Christianity's missing it. They celebrate Pentecost, or some of them, some churches do. They don't even know what Pentecost means. Fifty days, fifty days since what? Since the first fruits, and the days of unleavened bread. They counted the seventh Sabbath plus one, the morrow after which is the first fruits, the Shavuot, the counting of weeks. And they have no clue. They don't know. Meanwhile, there are people in these congregations who are having getting a clue. They are going back to their Bibles. They're reading it. And they're going, oh, this has so much more meaning now. They see their Messiah in all of these feasts. And they see what could be coming, what's going to be coming soon. And so many in the churches are rejecting that revival. And Pentecost, that, that's all what it is. And, you know, not everyone's meant to see it. And there will be many who see it later. There are many who are still coming to the knowledge and truth. So if people, you're talking, you know, I tell people, don't push this on people. Let them come to it on their own. Pray for them. Pray for your spouse if they don't see it. Don't push this. Pray for them. Lift them up in prayer. Um, there's some amazing things that are, that are coming soon in the days ahead. And we're going to see many miracles. And uh, he's going to receive the glory for all of them. Just like he did during the miracle of Acts chapter 2. You know, that was also Shavuot. But uh, there's a marriage coming. The marriage has already, I believe, taken place. It could be. You can make a case for it taking place. What's going to happen when he comes back to find his bride? Adulterous bride or a clean bride who has been keeping his commandments, waiting hand and foot for her groom to come back and take her? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right, we'll leave it at that. Have a great Shavuot. Go home, read your Bible. Thanks.